maps. So it's a pleasure to be here, and I was, as I was putting this talk together, I was looking at some pretty high-powered stuff, and my wife said, uh, David, you're not speaking to an audience full of neuroscientists. So I thought, well, before I talked about advances, I should basically lay some groundwork, because I really don't know what the audience is comprised of, but I suspect we have some artists and musicians and hippies and people that maybe are not neuropharmacologists. So what I'm going to do is lay a little groundwork that leads up to it and then talk about a couple of the things that we've done, some of the problems that we've encountered and maybe how we've approached them. <clears throat> and the general overview of the talk is as follows. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the chemistry. How can we study psychedelics without using humans? And this is a question everybody might wonder. And I'll tell you how we do it and, and its limitations. And what are the receptor targets in the brain? We know quite a bit about that. Uh, and what and where are the receptors located? And then I'm going to talk about some new things that we're looking at with respect to LSD, which is a unique compound in this category of psychedelics. So the common misconception of psychedelics is something like this. <laughs> Tell the average guy on the street that you're interested in psychedelics, and immediately it's some kind of a weird uh, mental meltdown that they think of. <clears throat> and of course, the people here don't need to be told or uh, lectured to about that this is really not uh, what we're looking for. I like this definition. This was in Goodman and Gilman's uh, pharmacology handbook uh, in the eighth edition. This is the Bible for pharmacologists. It came out for one edition and uh, it didn't, and they changed the definition after that. Maybe they didn't like it, but I like it. It was written by uh, Jerome Jaffe. The feature that distinguishes psychedelic agents from other classes of drugs is their capacity reliably to induce or compel states of altered perception, thought, and feeling that are not or cannot be experienced otherwise except in dreams or at times of religious exaltation. When I teach the pharmacy students about psychedelics, I give this as a definition for the class. And many of you know there are things like beta blockers for, and antihypertensives and antibiotics. and Those things have very specific descriptions. And you give this as a description of a pharmacological class, and anyone with any training at all will recognize this is pretty unusual. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to illustrate a few events that I think are important in the recent so-called renaissance. Uh, this is an adaptation of a slide I use at Horizons, and you'll forgive me if I put some of my own accomplishments up there. <clears throat> the most important thing to notice is I've got these grouped by decades. And so you see in the 60s we had Walter Pankey completing his PhD thesis on the Good Friday Experiment, and Sasha publishing uh, with uh, Tony Sargent and Claudio Naranjo, structure activity relationships of one ring psychotomimetics. And that's what we called them back then, psychotomimetics, because they mimic psychosis if you took them, made you crazy. And then uh, uh, Pankey and Grove published their first paper. I was a graduate student. I was just graduating in 1973 and patented a method for making hallucinogenic amphetamine isomers so that they became available for researchers. Then Sasha and I published the first report in a, a book that not, from a NIDA proceeding about MDMA. Then in the 1980s, we had the Esalen Conference on MDMA that Rick Doblin was heavily involved in and sponsored uh, to try to find a way to keep MDMA from being scheduled. And that's where I actually met Rick. <clears throat> and then he activated Earth Metabolic Labs, a, a, a foundation that had uh, gone uh, dormant, and used that as a vehicle to start uh, doing some things. And then I met Rick Strassman uh, at that meeting, and we began to dialogue about his DMT study. And then in 1986, uh, Rick Doblin called me and said, I want to make MDMA into a drug, but nobody will make it for me. So I said, well, I'll make it for you. So uh, we uh, made two kilos, uh, did a pretty good deal on that one. <clears throat> <laughs> I think it cost uh, $1,500 a kilo. Uh, and that was with the paperwork for FDA. So it was a pretty good deal. And then uh, uh, George and Rick Talbert report on MDMA in the Journal of uh, Psychoactive Drugs. That was kind of an interesting thing. It was sort of the first legitimate publication on a, a utility for this. And, uh, and then I, I, 1986, 
I was concerned that MDMA was going to become classified, and the government people were saying it was just another, psych just another uh, hallucinogenic amphetamine. I didn't believe that. So I proposed this name, Intactogen, and said, this is a different class. And we published a series of papers showing, using chemistry, that MDMA could not be a hallucinogenic amphetamine. It had too many structural divergences. It was a representative of a novel a pharmacologic class. And then Rick founded uh, MAPS in 1986. 1990, um, we synthesized the first batch of DMT for Rick Strassman. 1991, the Shoguns published PICAL. Uh, the Hefter Research Institute was founded in 93. Rick Strassman published his human studies on DMT in 1994. And then Charlie Grobe and his colleagues published on the human psychopharmacology of Wawaska based on their studies of UDV in, in Brazil. And then uh, Franz Wollenweider and uh, Felix Hosser published on the pharmacokinetics of psilocybin, which was really nice. It showed a lot about plasma levels and correlating that with the activity of these drugs. <clears throat> and then the Shoguns published TCAL. Franz Wollenweider showed that you could block the effects of psilocybin in man with ketanserin, which was a specific serotonin 2A antagonist. A lot of animal studies had suggested that was the key receptor, but until Franz actually did that experiment, we didn't know if that was true in humans. So that was really the proof that the serotonin 2A receptor was a key receptor. Then uh, I became interested in trying to find a better way to make psilocybin because um, the Hefter Institute and other people were interested in getting psilocybin. And there was a, a key step in that that uh, Albert Hoffman had developed. There was a reagent that you had to use that could spontaneously detonate. And my technician was not particularly interested in making that reagent. So uh, he spent some time and we found a better way to make it and published it. Uh, and that made it more accessible for clinical use. <clears throat> And we used that uh, procedure to make psilocybin for the Griffith study. And then, uh, as you know, Roland published, and then I went to the 2000, uh, the next decade, Roland uh, published this paper showing spiritual experiences with uh, psilocybin, a, a landmark breakthrough paper that, as you know, got a lot of coverage. Uh, Francisco Moreno published a study on the safety of psilocybin and OCD. Then we had the Supreme Court up upholding the injunction against the DEA, preventing them from confiscating a wasca from the church. Many of the people here in this audience, and myself included, uh, testified or wrote briefs on behalf of the UDV, and you know that the UDV prevailed there. Um, and then Griffiths uh, published a study showing the long-lasting effects of psilocybin at 14 months. Really remarkable. These uh, positive personality changes persisted. It's permanent. It's not something that just happens while you're taking the drug. The Grobe study of psilocybin in cancer patients was completed. It's been through two versions of revision. It's sitting at Archives of Pharmacology or Archives of Psychiatry. Uh, we think it's going to be accepted. That will be another landmark paper. You know, Michael Mithover's study of MDMA, you saw the data there was completed. That's sitting at a journal psychopharmacology. They're expecting uh, acceptance of that. So we're going to have a couple of papers probably this year on these. <clears throat> uh, my son, Charles Nichols, is actually a professor doing serotonin work at LSU. And we've talked about uh, starting the Nichols serotonin dynasty. But uh, <clears throat> I, sent him a sample, I sent him a sample of DOI, which is a hallucinogenic amphetamine because when he started at LSU, he didn't have a license to work with Schedule I uh, substances, and DUI wasn't scheduled. And he had a Chinese postdoc that had been working in another lab looking at cardiovascular inflammatory processes. And they had some cells that they used for this assay, and he asked uh, Charles and my son, what about if I test DUI in that? And my son laughed and said, well, sure, go ahead, because it's a hallucinogen, it's going to do anything in cells. Lo and behold, it turned out it blocked the inflammatory response, completely blocked this inflammatory response in these rat aortic cells. And so they patented this. So and the, the funny thing is, the concentration to block that inflammatory response is 20 picomolar, which is way below the dose that would produce any psychoactive effects. LSD has the same effect, other psychedelics do, but they're not quite as potent as this. So it makes you wonder if some of the accounts of people having uh, immune responses or losing their allergies could be related to the fact that psychedelics block the immune uh, chain. <clears throat> and then, of course, in the new decade here, we have to say, that the Psychedelic Science Conference has to be a landmark in the development of this. The thing to notice, though, is how each of these categories has expanded, and we're getting more and more activity. And this is a limited selection, obviously. I've been biased in my selection. We could talk about some other things. But obviously, some things are starting to happen, some very positive things. So the three chemical types of psychedelics, and I'll use hallucinogens here too, <clears throat> interchangeably, are the phenethylamines, and the representative of this would be mescaline, and of course you have DOB, 2CB, all the 2CI, 2CT this and 2CT that. Those are all representatives of this uh, phen phenethylamine class. We have the tryptamines, and over here we'd have DMT, uh, psilocin, and psilocybin, 
5-methoxy-DMT would be the principal representatives in there. And of course, there are things where you've changed the R. You've got other things than methyl, isopropyl, ethyl, things like that. And these are generally active too. But that old glass of tryptamines. And then the lysergamides, um, this pointer is fairly feeble, but uh, if this is a methyl, a CH3, and these are two ethyl groups, carbon, two carbon ethyl groups, then you have LSD, which is representative of the ergolines. And you can see that they're a special case of the tryptamines. You see the tryptamine fragment buried within LSD. LSD is uh, one of the most potent hallucinogens. The most potent one at this point is probably where we've changed this R from a methyl to an ethyl. It's a compound we developed years ago called ethylad. That's a little bit more potent than LSD. <coughs> A little harder to make, so you haven't seen it. <clears throat> the interesting thing about the discovery of LSD that most people don't appreciate is drugs like Prozac and drugs for migraine would not be there for you right now if, if you were on those drugs had it not been for the discovery of LSD. LSD was discovered in, its effects were discovered in 1943, as probably everyone here knows. Serotonin was discovered almost contemporaneously, and <clears throat> There was no evidence that it was in the brain. In fact, the studies, um, the woman who established that it was present in the brain, the boss of her lab, Erwin Page, didn't believe that she'd find it in the brain. Because up to that time, um, if you had mental illness and schizophrenia, it was thought that you suffered from some nurturing deficit. Your mother had not uh, breastfed you properly or your toilet training had been screwed up or something like that. So <clears throat> when they found out that serotonin was in the brain, they suddenly said, well, LSD, we know LSD is a potent psychoactive compound. It's got this fragment that looks like serotonin. Maybe serotonin has something to do with behavior. Maybe neurochemistry has something to do with behavior. That sounds rather bizarre today, but in 1950, that was a very novel concept. The hypothesis that brain chemistry could affect behavior. And serotonin research was one of the big neuroscience areas. If you go back into the 1950s and early 60s, Serotonin was the neurotransmitter that everybody was looking at because of this connection between LSD and serotonin. <clears throat> uh, these are molecules of serotonin and psilocin where I've uh, minimized the shape using a computer and then these grids represent the actual surface of the molecule if you could see it in 3D. And what I've done is plot the electrostatic charges on top of that. So you can see a positive charge is blue, a negative charge is red. That may not show up real well in the light in here. But just to show you, there is a similarity between serotonin and psilocin, which is one of the tryptamines. <clears throat> so where do they work? The phenethylamines phenethylam uh, and tryptamines all activate serotonin 2A and 2C receptors and the 1A receptors for the tryptamines. LSD is a little more complex. <clears throat> We used to say that LSD was, had promiscuous pharmacology. <laughs> now what they say is it has rich pharmacology. The problem has been finding out how LSD works. So for those of you who took some algebra, you know that if you have a series of simultaneous equations, you can solve them for an unknown. Well, with the phenethylamines and the tryptamines, the 2A and 2C receptors are the things they have in common. And of course, with LSD, the 2A and the 2C receptor is what it has in common. The tryptamines and LSD also activate this other class of receptor, serotonin 1A receptor. So the, common, the commonality is, is activation of the 2A and the 2C receptors. And basically the consensus is that activation of the 2A serotonin 2A receptor is the essential component necessary but perhaps not sufficient for, I think it's working, it's just very feeble. <clears throat> It's necessary, but maybe not sufficient for the full range of effects. And obviously, with the, all the other actions that LSD has at brain receptors, and these are all high affinity interactions. They're not just things that it sort of kind of touches. These are high affinity. It sticks pretty tightly. <clears throat> so the serotonin 2A receptor, once we discovered that, people started looking at that. Now, this is a very critical target in the brain. It's actually one of the key targets for atypical antipsychotic drugs like Risperdal and, and uh, uh, olanzapine and things that, uh, that are used to treat schizophrenia. It's located in areas that are very critical for normal cognitive function. <clears throat> if we look at a section of a human brain, this is a post-mortem brain, former psychedelic user, and what we did is, uh, I didn't do this, this study was, uh, a slice was incubated with a radioactive tritium-labeled molecule uh, called ketanserin. Well, I think it just not, doesn't have enough amps or whatever, milliwatts. 
Ketanserin is a drug which binds to the serotonin 2A receptors and tight, binds tightly. So you can take this brain slice, soak it in a solution of ketanserin, and then wash it off, put it on a photographic plate, and then see where the radioactivity is stuck. And what you see is all these red areas, and this is the frontal cortex, and then in the rear part of the brain around the uh, visual occipital areas, those red areas are the expression, high expression density of serotonin 2A receptors. If you blow that up, the cortex is in a columnar form. So this would be the, I know it's working, but I just can't see it. This would be the outside of the brain out here. This would be the inside, looking from the inside out. These darker areas are cortical pyramidal cells. They're the major computational units in the cortex. And the serotonin 2A receptors, if you can see the blue arrows, they're, lo they're located <clears throat> on what are called the apical dendrites. The cell body is a triangular shaped area, and then just above it in the apical dendrite is where these serotonin 2A receptors are located. <clears throat> just to give you an idea of what the cortex looks like, it's a pretty amazing piece of electronic machinery, bioelectronic machinery. This is a schematic diagram, and these are the pyramidal cells. They have roughly a pyramidal shape. They project up to the outer layers of the cortex, and these are uh, labeled uh, areas L1 through uh, L6, <clears throat> and there are a lot of cells here. This actually is a slice from mouse somatosensory cortex, and what they've done here is take those pyramidal cells, and they've uh, had them expressing a green fluorescent protein, so you can see them. So the only thing you see here are the pyramidal cells, but all these other cells are in there. Just to show you the density, and this is a wiring diagram that's been used as a simulation for how that cortical function works. So the cortex is a pretty amazing thing, and it has these uh, processing units that are arranged in columns, and there are these oscillations that are going on all the time in these cortical units, and the cells work together and they get input from other areas of the brain, and we'll talk about that. So the cortex with its serotonin 2A receptors is a, an important site, and these serotonin 2A receptors are located on the pyramidal cells, and what they do is they reduce or depolarize the membranes of those cells so that they fire more easily. The net effect is that cortical pyramidal cells increase their gain or they increase the signal to noise ratio. So that is they can pick up weaker signals and amplify them. <clears throat> just to remind you what a synapse looks like, this is just a typical synapse. So what we're talking about is the serotonin 2A receptors are located in the membranes of these cortical pyramidal cells. And then we have axons that come from various parts of the brain that release serotonin, and they hit these receptors, and they produce this activation in the cortical pyramidal cells here. <clears throat> so that's sort of what's going on outside. What happens when serotonin or a psychedelic hits these receptors? What happens in the brain cell or in the cortical cells? Some basic terminology. These are called dose-response curves, and, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. These are dose-response curves, and what they represent is the effect of a drug as a function of how much of the drug is in the solution. So if we're measuring some, any effect here, we define some effect, functional effect, and we put serotonin in here. As we increase the dose, what you get is a, what's called a sigmoidal curve, like this, that reflects the effect of serotonin at various concentrations. And since serotonin is a normal endogenous transmitter, the full effect is defined as what serotonin can do. What serotonin produces over here is, by definition, the full effect, the 100% effect. If we put a drug in that blocks serotonin receptors, so it occludes it, so serotonin can get to the receptors, depending on how much we put in, it'll move that curve to the right. So now as the concentration goes up, it takes a larger concentration to produce the same effect. Then we have these things called partial agonists. You see they activate the receptor, but no matter how much you put in, they don't get to this full 100% effect. Psychedelics are partial to full agonists. They usually lie in this range here. So some of them come very close to being as, a, as potent as serotonin. Others are much weaker. LSD is a weak partial agonist. So these are the kinds of things that you see with respect to the signaling in the cell after you put a psychedelic or a transmitter on. <clears throat> Inside the cell, we have second messenger or signaling pathways. So here's an example. Here's what it was thought for many years that serotonin 2A receptors did. And I'm not going to go into the structured receptors. I'll do that in the workshop on Monday for those of you that are going to be there. <clears throat> but 
What this is is a, a protein that's wound around in little helical segments that goes back and forth through the membrane, and that's a bundle of these helices packed together. And when the serotonin interacts, or the psychedelic interacts in the top here, in this bundle, it causes the receptor to change its shape. And these things down here are called G proteins. They dissociate, exchange GDP for GDP, and they activate various enzymes. In this case, this G alpha protein activates an enzyme called phospholipase C, which hydrolyzes parts of these membranes and produces two signaling molecules, inositol triphosphate, inositol phosphates, and diisoglycerol. And then these things carry on. Diisoglycerol activates a, a protein kinase C, and that changes the membrane potential. So these are called signaling molecules. So the receptor is just here to turn on these signaling molecules. So we have the chemical hits the receptor, the receptor changes its shape, that causes these to be released and activate the signaling molecules. This was a classical view of what serotonin 2A agonists did. <clears throat> well, they don't just do that. They also turn on the phospholipase A2 pathway. And they do it to a different degree depending on what the particular molecule or psychedelic is. So now we have at least two pathways. Well, things are getting a little more complex now. <clears throat> And that's relevant because if you actually look at the ability to activate those two pathways, you see that different molecules have different effects. So here's serotonin itself in the phospholipase and the arachidonic acid assays. You see that serotonin, by definition, reaches the 100% response. And its ability to activate is almost identical for both of those pathways. Here's LSD. Here's the uh, phospholipase C activation, arachidonic acid activation. In neither case do we achieve the 100% that we got with serotonin. In fact, LSD is more potent in arachidonic acid release than in phospholipase C, achieving less than 50%. So it's a weak partial agonist in both of these pathways. Silicin, by contrast, both of those pathways reach the same maximum in contrast to LSD, but there's a slight difference in potency. <clears throat> and you see that arachidonic acid release is more potent. It takes less to do that than phospholipase C. Is everybody following this? Stop me if you're not. <clears throat> well, so why is this important? We want to know what are the signals in the cell that cause the psychedelic effect. Well, <clears throat> it becomes very complicated. This is a compound called 2CI. It's a psychedelic phenethylamine. And what you see is we have two curves here, one for arachidonic acid release and one for phospholipase C activation as a function of increasing concentrations of 2CI. <clears throat> We have the same thing for this n-benzyl compound and the same thing for the TCB2. And if we actually compare the ratios for turning on these two pathways, the ratio of the EC50 for turning on PI versus EC50 for arachidonic acid release, the ratio is 1.2 psychedelic, about one to one, okay? <clears throat> TCB2, the ratio is closer to six. And this compound is commercially available. It's sold as a selective a PLC activating serotonin 2A agonist, psychedelic. This compound, extremely potent, in between these two in terms of signaling, it's not psychedelic. Well, that isn't getting us anywhere. So, but these things are important because we don't understand what are the signals in the cells that cause the psychedelic effect. <clears throat> this is a table summarizing ratios for a number of compounds, but it's uh, easier to see it uh, just like this. So here's the PLC potency activation for a number of compounds, LSD, psychedelic, these two not psychedelic, uh, until we get to these over here, which are phenethylamines, 5-methoxy-DMT, and psilocin. You see the ability to activate the phospholipase C pathway decreases, phospholipase A2, uh, PLA2 potency increases in the opposite direction. Well, we still don't know what's the signal. Psilocin is very potent in activating PLA2, signal, but LSD is more active in activating the PLC potency. So that doesn't get us very far. <clears throat> and the reason this is important to me as a researcher is because I keep asking the question, why is LSD so potent? Here's DOB, it's a phenethylamine, the dose is maybe one, two, three milligrams. LSD, the dose is, what, tenth of a milligram, two tenths of a milligram? And if you, if you look at these, though, the potency Affinity for the receptors is about identical, but the ability to activate the receptor for DOB is 80% here, 75% here, for LSD 22% and 
LSD is really a rather weak compound in terms of activating that receptor. And this is a puzzle that no one has been able to solve. Why is LSD so potent? <clears throat> well, it gets even more ugly. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I had a, a visiting scholar named Niels Jensen who went to do a postdoc in Brian Ross lab, and we sent him a bunch of compounds. This is a piece of it. It's unpublished data. They uh, told me I could uh, publish it. This is called a heat map. And that, what this represents is the strength of a signal. So that <clears throat> something that is very potent is over here in the white, something that's less potent is over here. It's almost like heat. Things that are hot would be glowing red and then white hot, right? These are eight different signaling pathways. <clears throat> here's that arachidonic acid release. Here's PLC activation, those two we just talked about. Here is DOI. Here is uh, 2CB fly. This is TCB2. This is bromo dragonfly. This is bromo fly. And this is that N benzo compound, which is not psychedelic. All the rest of these are. And every one of these has a completely different signaling fingerprint. No one knows what the signaling fingerprint is that's necessary. And every one of these signals is transmitted by activation of the serotonin 2A receptor. If we put a drug in that blocks the serotonin 2A receptor, every one of these signals is blocked. So analyzing this is, this is right at, I mean, this paper is not even published yet. This is state of the art. What is the signal that's involved in producing the psychedelic effect? <clears throat> so let's move out of that because if I go any farther, it's going to become even more difficult. How does a receptor signal change consciousness? Well, this is a question everybody would like to know. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you how I think it could do some of that. I have to watch my time. <clears throat> this is a schematic of the brain. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you all the places that serotonin 2A receptors are located. <clears throat> First of all, as I've just indicated, they're located on the apical dendrites of these pyramidal cells. And these are the major computational units in the cortex. And the cortex, especially the frontal cortex, is where we make sense of the world. This is where we make executive decisions. It's where sort of the gestalt the everything, you know, our, our reality is put together. <clears throat> there are inner neurons that couple these together that are inhibitory that also have serotonin 2A receptors. The Raphe nucleus is a very ancient area at the top of the brain stem in the midbrain, and all the serotonin in the brain comes from these Raphe cells. The locus ceruleus is about in the same area of the brain. It's also evolutionary, very old, and all the norepinephrine in the brain comes from the locus ceruleus. And the ventral tegmental area is an area of dopamine cell bodies. There are two of them, the ventral tegmental area and the uh, substantia nigra. And they make all the dopamine that goes to the higher brain. So normally when the brain is functioning, all the information that we're getting, uh, except for olfaction, is coming in and being processed through the thalamus. And there are a number of nuclei. The thalamus is in the middle of the brain. All your sensory information is coming in and being processed through the thalamus, and the thalamus is deciding what's important. It's filtering it out and deciding what's important, and then it's sending it on so ultimately it reaches the cortex. <clears throat> there aren't many serotonin 2A receptors in the thalamus, but in the paper that was published showing the uh, analysis of where these were located, one of the areas that they missed that I was interested in was this reticular nucleus. This is a thin sheaf of tissue that wraps around the thalamus. It sends inhibitory fibers into the thalamus. It gets its input from the thalamus. And it actually regulates what gets through the thalamus. And there's a lot of serotonin 2A receptors in, the, in this reticular nucleus. And nobody's actually studied that area. So this is sort of a, a, a gate, if you will, on what gets through the thalamus. And the thalamus decides what gets through to the cortex. The Raphe cells fire at a rate that's cor that corresponds to your level of vigilance. So when you're awake and moving around, the Raphe cells have a regular firing rate. Tick, 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 tick. When you start getting drowsy, if my talk is dragging on, your Raphe cells start going tick, tick, tick. And for those of you that partied too late last night and you fall into REM sleep while you're in here, your Raphe cells stop firing altogether. <clears throat> Psychedelics cause Raphe cells to stop firing, like when you're in REM sleep. Well, that's very interesting because when they stop firing, they quit sending serotonin up here, and all the serotonin signals are shut down. The locus ceruleus is an interesting area. Uh, depending on who you believe, it has all kinds of roles, but one role for it is it's been called 
the novelty detector. So the novelty detector, the locus ceruleus fires in bursts. And it fires when something unusual happens. And it can focus your attention. So as I'm speaking here, if someone in the back falls out of their chair and has a tray full of glass and it breaks and makes a loud noise, everyone is going to, what's that? That's your locus ceruleus. It's firing, saying, here, something to pay attention to. And then it gets to the cortex and you decide, is this something that's important or should I listen to Nichols talk some more? What do psychedelics do in the locus ceruleus? Well, they don't change its basic firing rate, but they enhance its burst firing. So they make it burst fire more intensely and longer for things that normally would not produce novelty. And I like to think that this is what happens when you look at a flower and you've seen millions, thousands, or hundreds of thousands of flowers in your life. Okay, it's a flower. But when a psychedelic activates the locus ceruleus so it increases its burst firing, Wow, that's a flower. Oh, that is really cool. So that's kind of what I think the locus ceruleus could do. <clears throat> and the locus ceruleus and, and the raphe, both serotonin and norepinephrine, interact with the, this area in the apical dendrite. Serotonin are serotonin 2A receptors, and uh, for nep norepinephrine, they're alpha 2 receptors, and they share the same signaling pathway. They activate phospholipase C. So they both activate these cells. The VTA releases dopamine, <clears throat> and when you're dreaming, it still releases dopamine. One of the pathways I've left out is an acetylcholine pathway that comes from a, another brainstem uh, region that's responsible for REM sleep. But normally when you're sleeping in REM, the locus ceruleus is not firing, the raphe is not firing, the dopamine is firing here, and then this acetylcholine nucleus is firing. But with the psychedelic, these are not firing. It's like you're asleep, but you're awake because you're cortical cells have been stimulated. Now there's one other thing that happens, and I don't have it on here. The way the cortex is organized is these pyramidal cells are organized in columns, and they first discovered this in the visual cortex. So when a signal comes into one of these columns in the cortex, it sends out what are called collaterals, adjacent interneurons to adjacent columns, and it releases an inhibitory transmitter called GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. So it silences those and allows it to focus. So if there's an activity in the cortex, it silences its adjacent cortical uh, cells so that the activity is focused. Serotonin 2A receptors located on these GABA interneurons shut off the release of GABA so that now you have spread from one column to the next. You lose the focus in the cortex. So you can kind of imagine a synesthesia process. Instead of being focused very tightly, now the signal is spilling over to adjacent cortical areas. So overall, what we've done is we've probably affected the information that's getting through the thalamus and getting sent to the cortex. We've activated these cortical cells so they have enhanced gain, signal noise ratio. We've shut off the inhibitory cells between those cortical cells that normally would inhibit adjacent columns. We've turned the locus ceruleus and raphe into states that normally would look like dreaming, uh, raphe being shut off, but locus ceruleus being turned on and it normally would be off during dreaming, so it's activating these cells as well. And we're activating, the VTA is releasing more dopamine. So it really disturbed the overall architecture of normal states of consciousness. And that's a gross simplification. I'm an organic chemist, so <clears throat> that's the best I can do for today. <clears throat> Interestingly, Franz Vollenweider has done a lot of really cutting edge uh, uh, brain scanning, and he's really the world's top guy in this field. And I got this picture from him years ago, and thanks, Franz. I've used this picture a lot. Here's a resting state of the brain cutaway, and you can see this is the prefrontal cortex. An activation in this PET scanning represents redder areas, and you can see that after psilocybin, we have activation of the cortex, increased redness. So we're turning on the cortex. <clears throat> can you tell who that is? And this actually says Sasha on the little name tag here. <clears throat> so um, unlike my good friend Sasha, I can't do this at Purdue. Um, many, many people have volunteered to do this at Purdue, but I can't do it. <clears throat> so how do I study psychedelics? Okay, I can do this brain chemistry and receptor site stuff and all. How can we study them? <clears throat> it's a huge problem. And over, and over the years, 
I use lots of different techniques. In the background, we have a superfusion bath. We use condition avoidance response disruption when I was a graduate student. I used smooth muscles from dog uh, vascular strips, looked at mouse locomotor activity, cat limb flick, all these things. Rat drug discrimination, which we still use, radio ligand binding, we developed I-125 DUI as a radio ligand. Um, locomotor activity in rats, we still do that. Measurement of signals, we're working on computer models of uh, serotonin 2A receptors. All that has led to drug discrimination is probably the best model for this work. <clears throat> and I'll explain to you how this works. These are operant chambers, and <clears throat> two sides are cut away, the front and the end are cut away. And so we put a rat in here. <clears throat> now in the wild, rats don't press levers. So the first thing we do is we teach the rat to press a lever. Now I won't go into how we do that, but we teach a rat to press a lever. And after he picks up that technique, we then put him into a chamber with these two levers, right and left, and this pellet trough delivers a 50 milligram sucrose pellet. That's candy, sucrose, right? It's rat candy. <clears throat> so he gets rat candy whenever we feel like rewarding him. So let's say on Monday we give the rat LSD, we put him in the box, and we activate this right lever. It's hooked up to a micro switch. We don't turn the left one on. He wanders around the cage. He knows how to press the lever, so he starts pressing these. He presses the right lever, and he says, and he hears a click, and his rat candy drops down. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> he does it a couple times, and we take him out. <clears throat> the next day we put him in, we turn this lever off, we turn this one on, we just give him a placebo, 0.9% uh, sodium chloride and water. And now we turn this one on. He wanders around, checks out the levers. He presses this one, and he starts getting rat candies. <clears throat> we do that for two to three months. And eventually, the rat reliably learns that if we give the rat LSD, he presses the right lever. If we give him placebo, he presses the left lever. And we alternate that. So half the rats are trained with LSD or drug on the left and half on the right. So we don't have any hand in this. <clears throat> On any given day, then, if we give the rat LSD and we put him in that box, he'll press this lever. And this is an, a really robust response. That rat will press 2,000 times in 15 minutes. The practical consequence of, of that is 2,000 rat candies were breaking us on our budget. <clears throat> so we raised the, the ratio up, so the rat has to press this lever 50 times to get one of these reinforcement pellets. So it's trained on an FR50. It's called a fixed ratio 50 presses 50 times on the correct lever, he gets a reinforcement. <clears throat> now the really neat thing about this assay is something called the third state hypothesis. And what that means is, once you've trained the rat to respond on LSD, if you give him uh, amphetamine, cocaine, anything else, he doesn't respond on the LSD lever, he responds on the placebo lever. He only responds on the LSD lever if you give him something that he perceives as like LSD. So we develop a new analog, our new derivative, I don't want to use the word analog, right? Control, controlled substance analogs. <clears throat> we develop a new molecule. We wonder, we've done some receptor binding stuff. Ten or five? Ten. I could do this. <clears throat> so we put him in there, <clears throat> we give him the new drug, and what does he do? He presses the lever. He says, I think you gave me LSD. And if it doesn't have the effect, then he presses the other lever. So basically, we have an assay where the rat says, I think you gave me LSD, or I don't think you gave me LSD. And that's as good as it gets in this preclinical model. But that's actually proven to be pretty useful for us. <clears throat> the reason being, if we look at this, <clears throat> what these are are the ED50s for drug discrimination compared with LSD. So we have a ratio of the potency of these drugs compared with LSD in rat drug discrimination. And we've done the same thing in humans, taken the dose of LSD as set it as arbitrarily 100%, and then compared the potency of these other drugs. And what you see is here's Ethlad, this more potent than LSD in the rats. So it's 185 times more potent than LSD in rats. In humans, about 140, 40% more. 200, 100 something, 100, 100, 100. And what you see, they're not exactly the same, but in general, there's a trend. 2, 1, 9, 2, 6, 2, 3, 3, 2, 2, 6, 1. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 0.4. So if you plot these out as a, as a plot, you'll get a linear correlation between potencies in drug discrimination and potencies in humans. So it gives us an indication of potency. 
We will occasionally get false positives. The, the rat will say, I think you gave me a psychedelic, when in fact we know it wasn't a psychedelic. But it doesn't seem to give us false negatives. So it tells us, the rat says, I think you gave me a psychedelic, and this is how potent I think it is. And that's pretty useful information. <clears throat> I wish we could go further. I was at a meeting uh, on MDMA years and years ago, it might have been at Stanford, and we had a panel, and Sasha and I and some other people on it, and after the talks, we were sitting in the panel, and somebody from the audience raised their hand and said, well, you've talked about rats and enzymes and all this, but what about the spiritual aspects of MDMA? And no one wanted to handle that, and I leaned up to the microphone and said, well, my rats are atheists. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, that's what I have to do in a pharmacy school at a Midwestern university. <clears throat> So now I'd like to talk in the remaining seven or eight minutes. Why is the diethylamide of LSD so unique? <clears throat> you know, Albert Hoffman made 80 some analogs of LSD. And it was only the diethyl uh, that proved to have this activity. And we have a library, my technician has made a library of 20 or 25 lysergamides. None of them have the unique activity that LSD has. So we asked the question, why is that? What's, what is it about the diethyl group? Well, one hypothesis is that whatever the receptor it binds to looks like, it maybe have a specific place that the diethyl group binds. How could we test that? <clears throat> it took us about 10 years to complete these studies because we started with a bunch of different derivatives. But one way to test that is to lock the groups. So these groups here, this is an ethyl and this is an ethyl. So this is the diethyl amide group. And those ethyl groups can rotate and swing around and adopt a variety, an infinite variety of shapes. We thought, how can we lock it into some specific shapes to see? One way to do that is to incorporate these ethyl groups into a rigid four-membered ring. So this looks, you see, we have the two ethyl groups, we have the two ethyl groups. So what we've done is tie these two carbon atoms together with another carbon atom. So that's a rigid four-membered ring. It's called an azetidine. And these methyl groups that are attached that would represent the ends of these ethyl groups <clears throat> are either on the same side of that ring, which is called a cis-meso, or they're on opposite sides. And we have two isomers. We have an RR trans and we have an SS trans. So we have three isomers of molecules that could have a four-membered ring with these two methyls. So here's, <clears throat> here's, what they, here's what they look like. Here's LSD from the front with the front ethyl group pointed down and the back ethyl group up, or the front ethyl group pointed up and the back ethyl group pointed down. And these are the corresponding dimethyl azetidines, and you can see the relative similarity. And if we look at them from the top, you see here's LSD with the ethyl groups in this orientation and switched with the ethyl groups in this orientation. And these are the two azetidines, the uh, SS trans and the RR trans. You can see the overall similarity. So we tested these both in our receptor binding and in rat drug discrimination. <clears throat> and sure enough, only one of these three isomers is active, and it's this one. So we know that when the LSD binds to the receptor, the ethyl groups are in that particular orientation. And in receptor modeling studies we've been doing recently, and I don't have a slide for that to show you because we don't have time, but we know that the receptor is evolved and has amino acid residues that just have a pocket that's the size of that diethyl group. So it just fits. So whether coincidence or whatever, the serotonin 2A receptor has evolved to have a pocket that when a lysergic acid derivative binds, the diethyl is the one that has optimal binding properties and activation properties. Peculiar presentiments indeed. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, in the, the last part of this is <clears throat> I want to do an experiment. Can we bring the house lights up? Daniel Friedman. Just enough so I can see hands. And turn the camera so we can film everybody. No, no, don't. <clears throat> Daniel Friedman was uh, one of the premier LSD researchers. Uh, he trained a lot of LSD researchers at the University of Chicago. He was the head of psychiatry at UCLA. And he did the early clinical studies with LSD. And he told me on many occasions, and he has this written in a book in 1984, talking about his subjects that were given LSD. What is striking is that the trip unfolds through an acute phase, about four hours and a four to six hour second phase. During the second six hours, subjects fairly regularly report that they had been at the least self-centered and usually suspicious with ideas of reference or even paranoid convictions. Nobody has studied that. He's told me on many occasions, Dave, I think this is important. Now I want to do an experiment. If you're willing to do it, you don't have to. 
I would guess that we have a fair number of people in here who have taken LSD. If you're willing to participate in the experiment, we're not going to film you. Would you raise your hand if you've taken LSD and just keep it up? Now, <clears throat> just as I suspected, turn the cameras. Now keep your hands up. Now keep your hands up. Now, what I want to know, <clears throat> for those of you who have taken LSD, there are two choices. It's wonderful euphoric psychedelic for the whole eight or ten hours, or it's wonderful psychedelic for four or five hours, and then things get weird and dark, and maybe you think you're going crazy, and those kinds of things. For everybody who takes LSD and it's eight hours of pure psychedelic wonder, drop your hands. Okay, but some of your hands are still up, right? For some of you, and I think some of you are lying, but for some of you, <clears throat> you have this effect. LSD is unpleasant in the later parts. Some people like it. You know, that's when you do the hard work. That's when you do the integration. But other people say, give me a valium. I want it to stop. <clears throat> we wondered if we could study this. So we train rats, as I showed you, in drug discrimination. We give them LSD. We train them 30 minutes later. And this is what it looks like based on time. Whoops. This is what it looks like. 100% at 30 minutes, and then as time goes on, they lose the ability to pick up the effect of LSD. So we trained these rats and we waited 90 minutes instead. Is there some temporal effect? Well, sure enough, there is. Now, if we wait 90 minutes, the rats learn to discriminate that very easily, and now we see there's a different time course altogether. So there's a 30 minute and a 90 minute. Now, are they the same? They're well, not the same. <clears throat> If we take the LSD rats trained at 30 minutes, we can block the effect. This somehow got screwed up, but we can block the effect with a molecule that blocks the serotonin 2A receptor, but not with Haldol, a drug which blocks the dopamine D2 receptor. In the LSD 90 rats, we can't block the effect with drugs that block the serotonin 2A receptor, but now a dopamine receptor blocker does block the effect. So LSD has two different temporally related pharmacology effects in rats. Early on, it stimulates serotonin 2. Go sit down. Early on, it stimulates serotonin 2A receptors, and later it stimulates dopamine receptors. So now there's a pharmacological basis for why that happens. I still have two minutes. <clears throat> what the heck? I use heck. What the heck's going on? The key here is that I think that LSD forms a metabolite for some people. Eli Lilly had a compound called Lurgatrol years ago, and when you develop a new drug, you have to characterize its metabolites in humans to see are they toxic. Maybe the drug's safe, but it might produce a toxic metabolite. So they were using an assay for dopamine receptor stimulation, which involved the inhibition of prolactin secretion. Lurgatrol itself produced a 55% inhibition of prolactin at 100 nanomolar, but this hydroxy Lurgatrol produced the same inhibition at one nanomolar. It was 100 times more potent as a dopamine agonist. LSD is a dopamine agonist, and it's a potent dopamine agonist. So what do we think happens? <clears throat> so here is the hypothetical plasma curve for LSD, which drops off at, say, four hours. And this back curve is the drug discrimination curve, actual data from rats. And I think what happens is it's, it's uh, hydroxylated in the liver to form 13-hydroxy LSD. And so that is this 90-minute cue. And this is what's producing the weird psychosis-like effects in humans. So we're trying to study that. It involves synthesizing that metabolite of LSD. We're about halfway there. We're going to test it. <clears throat> and here is a, one of those should make you feel better. Be sure to let me know which one it is. Ultimately, we want to find out ways to use these therapeutically. And let me tell you one other thing. <clears throat> you all know who Albert Hoffman is. You all know who Tim Leary is. You all know who Sasha Shogun is. How many people know who Arthur Hefter is? Go to our website and read his bio. This is the grandfather, the great godfather of psychedelic research. You don't have to donate to the Hefter Institute if you don't want to. Go to our website, though, and read the bio of Arthur Hefter. Amazing guy. And I think with that, <clears throat> I'd like to thank lots of graduate students, postdocs. National Institute on Drug Abuse funded my work for 28 years. And uh, my technician, Stuart, is here. He has been with me for 20 years. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being attentive, and we probably have Time for the question. Thank you. Thank you.
he's asking what I know about the cap opioid receptor, which is the target for salvinorin A. Um, I was interviewed for CNN on, by CNN on that, and they asked me, what do you think about salvinorin and salvia? I said, it's like Shakespeare said, much ado about nothing. Um, it's a very potent psychoactive drug, but I wouldn't call it psychedelic. I don't think it's, I don't think it's mind manifesting in that sense. It's a very different mechanism of action. Most of the people I know who have tried it have no desire to try it again. They didn't get any particular illumination. If you take high doses, it can have some very powerful effects, I agree with you. But I, I think you've got a completely different mechanism. And uh, they developed kappa opioid agonist years and years ago as an attempt, attempt to make non-addictive painkillers. And every one they developed produced what they called psychotomimetic effects, uh, dysphoria. So I think the kappa receptor is important. Maybe blockers of the kappa receptor may be useful for treating psychosis or schizophrenia, but I don't think there's any relationship. In the same way that atropine and scopolamine produce psychosis and can produce hallucinations and real true hallucinations, and they're not related. There are many ways you can disrupt consciousness that don't fall into the classical brain activation type effect. <clears throat> yeah, he's asking about glial cells. The role of glial cells in the brain, they support uh, neurons, they produce uh, uh, growth factors, a lot of things. Nobody really understands their role. It's like dark matter, right? What, 90% of the universe is dark matter, but we don't know what it does. There is a lot of interest in glial cells, but I don't think anybody's demonstrated relevance to psychedelic states at this point in time. <clears throat> So his question is about the serotonin versus the dopamine role uh, of LSD. The thing that I didn't tell you is that <clears throat> when you activate serotonin 2A receptors, about two to three hours later, the dopamine system becomes super sensitive. So part of this profile is that the activation of 5-HT2A receptors by LSD actually leads to a sensitization of dopamine receptors. And then the production of this highly potent dopamine metabolite is hitting sensitized dopamine receptors. So I don't think it's, I think, LSD is metabolized like lots of other things. It sort of is decreasing at four hours or so, and it's the accumulation of that metabolite. That's my hypothesis. Thank you. I might mention that dopamine, that dopamine effect is a dopamine D4 receptor, which nobody knows much about, and we've identified LSD as a, it principally activates D4 receptors. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Nichols, I'm very interested in this, this uh, kind of psychotomimetic effect of, of the uh, hydroxy metabolite and what role it might have in naturally occurring ergot alkaloid uh, uh, effects in humans that are not psychedelic. I'm thinking particularly of the uh, controversy around the Point Esprit uh, incident in uh, the early 1950s in France where a, a town was affected by something that created kind of a, a, a mass psychotic reaction. Yeah, I think, um, well the hands in here look to me like maybe 15 or 20 percent were people that experienced this second phase this would happen probably with any ergot. It happened with Lurgatrol. And uh, if it's as potent as I think, it could well be, even though those are weakly stimulating serotonin receptors, they still could be leading to a sensitization. So it may well be that if you had a village that was in ingesting ergot, for example, there might only be a certain percentage that would be fast metabolizers that would produce enough of that, and maybe those are the people got, that got acutely ill. So that's one, one hypothesis. Thank you. So I was wondering if you had any commentary or remarks about two papers that were published last year concerning endogenous hallucinogens, uh, specifically the sigma-1 system and what they're calling a trace amine system, and how that might correlate to consciousness. Uh, is Nick Cozy in here? <clears throat> um, I tend to think that if serotonin 2A receptors are activated, they're activated by serotonin. I don't think you need the intermediacy of DMT, for example. Sigma-1 receptors, I, I Personally, I don't have evidence for this, but my personal opinion is that the affinity of DMT for the sigma receptor is too low to be relevant. There's a lot of controversy. Uh, Nick Cozy, for example, is working on trying to try to find out. You could have higher local concentrations. I tend to subscribe right now to the serotonin 2A hypothesis because in the circuitry of the brain, that receptor is located in all the areas you need to really affect this thalamocortical uh, consciousness process. And I don't think there's any evidence for sigma receptors at, to be involved at that level. But I can't say it's not, but I don't. I basically don't subscribe to that particular theory at this time. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>
I'm very curious about the immunomodulatory effects and the anti-inflammatory effects of psychedelics that might be mediated, in your opinion, outside the CNS and being a peripheral mechanism. Yeah, those uh, studies were done in uh, rat aortic smooth muscle cells, and they were done, the assay they used was to add uh, TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and it activates a series of an inflammatory cascades, ICAM, NOS, some other things. They were able to completely, after adding TNF-alpha, they were able to completely block that effect with 20 picomolar DOI up to four hours after TNF-alpha. And if you know what biologics are, NBRO, they block TNF-alpha receptors. This would be a psychedelic completely shutting down the effect of TNF-alpha, which theoretically, and they're using a, cardi a rat cardiovascular disease uh, model. Theoretically, we could all be taking, a, you know, 100 micrograms of DOI and, and stopping the progression of our atherosclerotic process. Um, he's been trying to get a grant funded to actually take it into a mouse model of atherosclerosis. Um, the first review, the grant viewer said, well, everybody knows that 5 ht 2 agonists uh, activate the immune system and produce these effects. Well, it's not documented. There are anecdotal reports, and I think maybe some of the anecdotal reports of people having uh, their, their allergies went away or certain, I think that actually may be related to the psychedelic actually having a physiological effect in interrupting an inflammatory chain. Nobody's looked at that. Nobody, he didn't expect that this would happen. He was just sort of laughing at the postdoc, like, yeah, put a psychedelic in your inflammatory model. Yeah, nothing's going to happen. He didn't believe the first results, so went back, reproduced the whole experiment himself, and got exactly the same number, 20 picomore, which, as you may know, is an unbelievably low concentration. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Could you say a few more words about uh, the Receptor simulations you're doing are these molecular dynamic simulations? Yeah, we have an in uh, we have an in silico activated beta adrenergic receptor. Uh, that do you know something about the receptor crystallization of the beta receptor? It was crystallized with a an, basically an antagonist, an inverse agonist. Mm -hmm. So it's splayed out where this antagonist bound in. We took it out and we put an agonist called isoproterenol in. We did molecular dynamic simulations in a bilipid membrane with uh, explicit water. It's a 60,000 atom ensemble. We had uh, 240 nanoseconds of simulation with constraints to pull it in around the isoproterenol. And then we built homology models around that, which actually then you have to put LSD or DOI in and constrain it and do further simulations. So we're trying to develop a homology model that's sort of as a good simulation so that we can do virtual docking and maybe do structure-based design. It's really cool. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm uh, wondering if you're familiar with Peter Webster's research on the locus coeruleus and uh, the psychedelic effect on, pos on, on possible salience and uh, his theory that that might have a, an impact on uh, evolution, the re relationship between uh, any possible relationship between psychedelics and evolution uh, being focused on the locus coeruleus and the salience factor. I'm tangentially aware of that. Peter and I communicate every now and then. We've talked about, uh, you know, the hydrolysis of ergot alkaloids in Eleusis, and we had some discussion about locus ruis. I think we have some agreement, some disagreement, but I couldn't really address that because I'm not sure of all the points, but I think the locus ruis is important in the actions of these drugs, and I think he does too, but I think his approach is a little different than mine. <clears throat> 